So we're beginning a new series today called The Authentic You. The Authentic You. And our, I introduced all of this last week. Our series text comes from Colossians 3, 23 and 24, which says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. I talked about that phrase last week. For you serve the Lord Christ. Christ. I, uh, I said last week that I was reading that earlier last year, and that phrase just really stuck out to me. And I introduced this, this year's theme last week, and I got it from this scripture. I just have felt a connection to this phrase, for you serve the Lord Christ. I said it last week when I read that, and I kept reading it. It was, this, it was as if the Apostle Paul was talking straight to me. And uh, we know that it was written for the church at Colossae. Uh, he, he wrote it for them, but he, and he was saying it to them, but he's saying it to also us. He's saying it to me, and he's saying it to you. How many of you know this morning that there are a lot of things that I'm not responsible for, but one thing for sure that I am responsible for is me? You're awake this morning. I'm responsible for setting and meeting my own goals this year. I'm responsible for giving and seeking the Lord more this year. I'm responsible for working on my own marriage this year. I'm responsible for spending more time with my children this year. Any growth, any development, any maturity that takes place in your life, if any of that happens, I'm going to have to do it for me. Other people have to do what they're responsible for, but I alone am responsible for what I am to do and for my part. So I introduced our theme this year. We have it on the signs out front. The, our theme is, It Begins With Me. It Begins With Me. And it's a statement regarding mentality, re regarding perspective, concerning how, first of all, we will approach the opportunities of this year. Will we take advantage of them or do nothing while others walk through new doors, climb up to new levels, and accomplish greater things, walk into new adventures. If, if that happens for me, it's going to begin with me. Concerning how we will pursue the things of God this year. Will we do the same that we've always done? Will we do less? Will we do more? Or will we do nothing? Or, we give God, or will we give God more time, more space, more commitment, and more service? If that happens in my life, it begins with me. Will I grow this year? Will I learn some new things? Will I become more of what He's created me to be? Will I go higher? Will I go to another level? If I do, no one else is going to do it for me. I have to take on that responsibility to do, my, do that myself. If anything in the way of progress or forward movement happens in my life this year, it's going to begin with me. Two factors, let me just mention this, this real quickly. Two factors that are very important. If I am to accomplish... All that God has for me in 2022. Number one, I must not shun responsibility. I must not blame other people. I must not blame my circumstances. I must not blame limitations and use those kinds of things as excuses for my lack of achievement. I can't shun my personal responsibility. Secondly, I must not let myself try to be someone else. I must not let myself try to be someone else. And I, I, I know that's hard to do sometimes. I know that's hard to do sometimes because sometimes it looks like everybody else but you is blessed and prosperous and healthy and happy. And you're the only one stuck and miserable and defeated and going backwards. First of all, can I just say something? You don't ever really know what's going on in someone's life unless you live with them. And you can even live with somebody and not know exactly what's going on in their life. It's not always what people would try to get you to believe. So don't get caught up trying to be like or compete with other folks. They've got problems and issues too. I just want to make sure you understand that. Secondly, if you feel that way and if that is the case, you can change. Things can change. With God's help, everybody Everybody, somebody say, everybody still has room to go up. 
Everybody still has room to mature. Everybody still has room to progress. Nobody has arrived yet. But it will happen if you determine it to happen with God's help. So I'm suggesting to you one of the keys to your success this year is embracing the reality of who you are right now. Just accept it. Just accept who you are. Not trying to be someone else, but bringing your personality, your character, your strengths, your weaknesses, your gifts, and even your issues. Bringing all of that to God and saying, God, this is all that I am. And I don't know what you can do with me or through me, uh, somebody just like me, but Lord, I'm bringing to you what I am, and, and I'm here, and I'm just saying, take me for what it's worth. I'm giving you all that I've got. Lord, if you can do something with me and through me and in me, I say, do it. Do it, Lord. I'm all in. But some folks really have a hard time with that. Some folks really have a hard time just being themselves. They don't want to be themselves. And the reason they're always trying to be someone else is because you don't think you're good enough for God to use you. You think you've blown it too many times. You think you've, uh, you know, you've got too many bad habits. And some of you don't even like yourself. Some of you don't like the person you are. Some of you think back to 10 years ago and say, I wish I could be that person again. How many of you know you can't, you will never be used of God the way God wants to use you if you are constantly dwelling on the past and thinking about somebody that you're not any longer. We can't go, we, we're not going to go forward until we accept the reality of the moment, the moment, accepting the reality of who I am right now. I've got to do that. I've got, I just got to embrace that. And you have to do the same thing for yourself. You have to embrace the you that you are right now. Some of you don't like yourself. Some of you have devalued yourself. And you think that you have nothing of significance to give to the kingdom. Let me just tell you right here. If you think that, you're wrong. And I'm going to show you in this series from Scripture how valuable you are to God. How important you are to God and to the kingdom. No matter what you've done. How many of you remember Simon Peter? One of the original 12 disciples, he loved Jesus. He loved Jesus, but he often got it wrong. Said things he shouldn't say. Did things he shouldn't do. Had a temper problem. Cut off a, so a soldier's ear. Right down to the point where he cursed and denied Jesus on the night that he was arrested. He left the discipleship after Jesus was crucified. He quit. Can anybody relate to Simon Peter? But what happened after Jesus' resurrection? He found him and he restored him. And he said, Peter, if you love me, and I know you do, it's time to feed my sheep. See, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you have put on yourself and how you've marked or what you see yourself as right now, you are still valuable to the kingdom of God. You are still valuable. Somebody hear me this morning. You are still valuable to the kingdom of God. And even though you might be wishing you could go back 10 years to become the person that you once were, and now you dread who you are now, can I tell you that that was not your best day? Your best days are the ones that are coming. If you will hear the word of the Lord and hear the, the scripture, of, uh, hear God's word and hear God's scripture and apply it to your life, you can become somebody that can't even compare to that person, no matter how good you think you were or uh, way back then. 10 years ago, what God wants to create in you and do through you in the days to come. Those are your best days. How many of you want to see that come to fruition in your life? But it begins with the day just saying, okay, God, this is what I am. Simon Peter. If Simon Peter can be restored and on the day of Pentecost preach a sermon and 3,000 people get saved, God can use you too. Just come back. Just come back and begin again. I want you to see your value because the kingdom needs your contribution. We need you doing your part in the kingdom. We need you doing your part in this church as we serve the kingdom together. 
We need you. We need you. So we're diving into this series, and I really would just want to drive that home. I want to introduce you to this phrase and this concept, and I don't want you to forget it. Here's the phrase, the power of the authentic you. The power of the authentic you. There is power in the real you. Not the fake you, but the real you. The person God created you to be. And I just want to do something right now, and I, I, I just was praying and I felt led to do this at a certain place this morning. And I sense this is just a very spiritual moment right now. But I want to, are you listening? I want to officially release you from the pressure and the coercion to be anybody else but you. Right now, right now, just somebody receive that. Right now, we release you. We release you from the pressure and the coercion to be anybody else but the you God has created you to become. Anybody, does that feel good? Does anybody just feel the load get a little bit lighter this morning right now? Come on, just let that go. Just let that go. I'm, I'm not trying to be anybody else. I'm not going to try to compete with anybody else. I can't do some things that some other people can do. Have you come to understand that and just accept that? If you're still there, just, just do it. You might as well just accept it. I, I can't do what they can do. There are some other people that got more than I got. You know, that's all right. It's all right. We are made individually with various gifts and talents. But I just want to be the me and to do what God has called me to, to be and to do. Amen? Amen? I just want you to embrace the you that you are right now. Or else you'll never become what God has destined you to be. How many of you know you can't fix someone who's fake? You can't fix someone who's fake. So don't try to be fake. The power of the authentic you. And I've been on this search to find and discover the real me. Because I, wanted, I want to walk in the authentic me. I want to walk in this concept, the authentic self. And by the way, we should all want to be on this study, this journey, this, this search to find the authentic self because that's the only one that God anoints. Did you hear me? That's the only one that God anoints, your authentic self. He is not going to anoint your efforts to be somebody else. He is not going to anoint you when you're just copying somebody else. When you're just mimicking somebody else. When you're trying to duplicate something that somebody else has done. He's not going to anoint you to do that. God wants you to be you. And he has anointed you to be you. And the more you you become, the more anointed you will be. <laughs> I'm going to write that down myself. Let me just take a... <laughs> oh, I already did. I already wrote it down. Think about that now. The more you, you become, the more anointed you will be. What am I talking about? See, the reality is some of you don't know the real you yet. The real you is only discovered as you become more and more like Christ. This is a lifelong process. This, this is a journey. You ain't all of a sudden you're going to have one interaction and then all of a sudden, bam, it drops in your lap. No, this is a lifelong journey. I get to know me more as I get to know Christ because the real me is only found in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, let's go to the Word of God. And I want to begin this study this series with today's message that I've entitled, Allow Me to Reintroduce Yourself. Allow me to reintroduce yourself. And I'm going to read from Jeremiah chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. Jeremiah 1, 4, it says this, we're going to see how far we can get into this today. This is going to be a several week study. But how many of you are ready to learn more about the authentic you? The who you are in Jesus. Amen. Jeremiah 1, 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. 
Then I said, uh-oh, Jeremiah sounds like us. Oh, Lord God, but I cannot speak for I am a youth. Isn't that our response usually when we hear the word of the Lord come to us? We just, what's the first thing we do? Start thinking about every reason why we can't do what God's calling us to do. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth. Don't be throwing excuses back at me, Jeremiah. For you shall go to all to whom I shall send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Lord, touch somebody's mouth today. Because they got some words that sounds like somebody else touched their lips. Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms. Do you see that? He taught, he, Jeremiah, his initial response is, I can't even talk. And then God says, I've done put you over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, <laughs> to throw down. That might mean something different to some of y'all. To build and to plant. All right, so we're going to dive in right here. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But where are, where are my note takers at? And we got some note takers in here. I want you to write down this phrase right here because this is a precept that I need to make sure you are aware of, especially concerning this subject, this subject matter right here. Somebody write this down. Here it goes. Ready? God is the God of intentionality. God is the God of intentionality. Somebody say, He's intentional. God, how many of you know, doesn't act randomly. God doesn't act haphazardly. There is no word in the Bible for the term coincidence. No such concept in Hebrew thinking or Hebrew culture. Therefore, coincidence is not a consideration when assessing events or realities in Hebrew, in the Bible. Uh, therefore, it shouldn't be the same. It should be the same for us. God is not a God of coincidence. God does things deliberately. He is not random. He is methodical. He does things on purpose. He does things strategically. He is intentional. This means that his actions are never an end unto themselves. They are always a means to an end. Whenever God does anything, He's up to something. And because He's intentional, whenever He does nothing, He does nothing intentionally. So He's up to something when He does nothing. And when He answers your prayers, He's up to something. And when He doesn't, He's up to something. And when He opens a door, He's up to something. And when he closes it, he's up to something. When the answer to your prayer is yes, he's up to something. And when it's no, he's up to something. When you gain, he's up to something. And even when you lose, he's up to something. When people walk into your life, he's up to something. And when people walk out of your life, thank God, he's up to something. Our God is intentional, and He does everything with purpose, for purpose, and on purpose. See, this truth, it has to be something that goes deeper than our hearts. It, we have to take this into consideration. It, it should have an effect on our eyes. We, we need to see and we need to understand that when we look at God and when we look at what He does, when we hear what He says in Scripture, or when He speaks to our hearts, when He interacts with humanity, we should see that His actions and His words are intentional. They are on purpose. They are deliberate. Now, one of the observations that we can easily attain from Scripture 
is that God is very intentional or intentional, maybe even borderline obsessed with ensuring that you and I live with an accurate understanding of our identity. It's as if he's consumed with constantly communicating to you and me who we are. If God knows everything and forgets nothing, why does he keep repeating himself? He must be repeating himself, not because he needs to say it, but because we need to hear it. We need to be constantly and consistently, we need to hear his perspective on who we are. His, inspe his perspective is so important, and you need to know his perspective, because how many of you know that, that everybody has an opinion of who you are? And their opinion, though, we should always remember this, other people's opinion of you are always going to be based on limited experience and partial information. So we only give very small, just maybe no consideration to other people's opinion of you. But here's another thing. You have an opinion of you. You have an opinion. As I mentioned earlier, there are some things that you think about you that are contrary to what God thinks about you. And the reason we need to know what God thinks about us is because of this truth written by Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived on the earth outside of Jesus, where he wrote in Proverbs 23, 7, which says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it makes sense that God would continue in his word to reiterate to us what he thinks of us because it's because this truth that Solomon has pointed out that I'm going to live like who I think I am. Did you get that? I am going to live like in this life who I think I am. Whatever one thinks about themselves in their heart, that is the root. That is the source. That is the catalyst for their behavior and their activity. And you, re and you really can't change someone's activity until you adjust their understanding of their identity. Who are you allowing to define who you are? Are you allowing other people to define who you are? Are you allowing yourself to define who you are? Are you looking at your past to define who you are? Are you looking at your reputation to define who you are? Or are you listening to what God says about you and allowing your God, your creator, to come in and define who you are? Let me tell you why your past and your mistakes don't make very much difference. It's the fact that God God can take whatever you are right now and he can change who you are and now turn you into something that he has created you to become. Aren't you glad you're not stuck right now today where you are? So we don't listen to others and we don't even listen to ourselves. We need to listen to what God says. Because you may be able to change behavior, temp behavior temporarily, but if you haven't adjusted your mentality or your understanding of who your identity is, you're always going to fall back into the same redundant and repetitive and dysfunctional cycles of the other than God given identity. But I can reshape, but if I can reshape my thinking about who I am. If you can reshape your thinking about who you are, your behavior and your life will eventually follow who you come to know that you are. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So it makes sense that God continues to tell his people who we are. And he does it over and over and over in scripture. He says his people, they are made in his image. He said they are a special people. They are a significant people. They are a loved people. He says they are the head and not the tail. They are above and not beneath. They are, they are lenders and not borrowers. They are the apple of his eye. 
They are the pride of his heart. They are the object of his affection and the focus of his attention. They are the salt of the earth. They are the light of the earth. They are the chosen. They are the royal. They are a holy people. They are a peculiar people. And God does that because he can see things that we cannot see. If you don't sit where he sits, you can't see what he sees. Because where you sit determines what you see. And he sees things from an on high position looking down. We see things from down low looking up. And the reason God's perspective of you is so valuable is because he sees things from a different vantage point that no one else has. God sees us from up there. We see us from down here. And it becomes apparent that there is a gap between what God sees and what we see. The indicator that there is a gap between what God thinks of someone and what they think of themselves the indicator is their activity and behavior. Their activity and their behavior. If you want to know what someone thinks of themselves, look at their activity. If you want to determine whether or not someone values themselves, look at their behavior. Look at their activity. That's how you know. That's the indicator. Now, some of you might say, well, I don't, I don't think lowly of myself. Well, you, you might not think lowly of yourself, but you still might not see yourself the way God sees you. Your prayer life, the verbiage that you use might be an indicator of how you see yourself. I have since learn to be aware of such. But there was a, a time when I found myself, I would, I would come into God's presence knowing that I am a son of God, but I prayed like a beggar. Please, God. Please, God. Please provide for me today. Please protect me today. Pre please today, Lord, give me peace. Please, Lord, pour out your spirit. Do you understand that all of those things he has already promised to those that are his? You don't have to beg God. If you feel that you do, then there's a gap in your revelation of what God thinks about you and what you think about yourself. You don't have to beg God. I, I could tell you, I, if someone were to ask me, I would say, yes, I've been forgiven of my sin. I mean, that's, that's what it says. That's what the Bible says. I, I guess I believe it, you know. I, I've been forgiven, and I think I understood that. But until I realized that I still struggled when I came to God, I still dealt with guilt, and I still dealt with shame, and, and I was intimidated to pray and, and to expect and to believe from God and to, to declare the goodness of God over my life. I, you know, and see, what that does is all of that reveals a gap in what I see myself to be and what God has said I am. God has said, according to the book of Hebrews, he says, come boldly into his presence. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and grace to help you in time of need. Have any of you ever experienced forgiveness? But the first thing you do when you come into God's presence is you keep rehearsing everything you've ever done bad. My wife quoted the scripture, Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so, how, so far as he cast my transgressions from me. He forgot about them. Why you keep bringing them up? Why don't you get beyond that? Realize that's not you anymore. Is anybody glad that's not me anymore? And he does not hold me accountable for those things anymore. I used to do it, but I don't do it anymore. Those things are now under the blood. I don't have to rem re remember them. I don't have to rehearse them. I don't have to bring them up. Thank God every time I come into his presence, it's covered. It's done with. It has been dealt with. It's under the blood. Now I just walk into his presence and say, thank you, Lord. By the way, I come bold into his presence. I can come boldly to the throne of God. You can go boldly to the throne of God. You just got to carry the right name with you. You go in Jesus' name. 
You understand who you are and whose you are. You understand your identity. And I understand that He is in me, but also I am in Him. He is in me, but I am in him. Colossians 3, 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. If you are a believer, you are now hidden with Christ in God. I can take this piece of paper right here. I can take this piece of paper and I can put it in this Bible and I can carry it all over the stage. But you don't see the paper. You see the Bible. Why? Why? Because the paper is in the Bible. When God sees me in Christ, how many of you know when you come before his throne, he no longer sees you, he sees Jesus. Because you are in him. Now I can, that's how I can come boldly before his throne because he doesn't see me, he sees the blood of his son. He sees his son. And when I come into him, he says, look here comes Jesus. That ought to flip the light switch on for some of you who still feel like you're so guilty that you can't lift your hands and give God praise any longer. No, you've been forgiven. You have been redeemed. You are set free. Amen. And if it's a part of your past, let it, be a part, uh, let it be a part that stays in your past. Don't keep bringing it up in your future. You don't have to bring it up and rehearse it every day and remember it. It's done. It has been dealt with. Anybody glad today that it has been dealt with? And the Father hears me when I come to pray. Not just because I, of who I am, but because of who I'm in. But for too many of us, there's a gap. There's a gap in our mentality. If I say I'm the apple of his eye, but I still have this constant struggle called worrying. If so, there's a gap. Here, here's the thing, here's the thing. Every biblical commandment is predicated on you accurately understanding the you that God says you are. Every biblical commandment is predicated, is based on you accurately understanding that you, that you are the, the you that God says you are. And Matthew 6 says, don't worry about what you shall eat, drink, or wear. See, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense unless you have an accurate understanding of the you that's in Christ. Not worrying. That is only possible after your perception of you changes. But for too many of us, there's just that gap. That gap between what I think of me and what God has said of me. Listen to this. You don't need more faith to stop worrying. You don't need more faith to stop worrying. What some of you need is a new revelation of the you that's hidden in Christ. You need a new perception of what God has promised to his sons and his daughters here in the earth. I ain't talking about heaven. Of course, all those, all those, the blessings immeasurable and, uh, and, and not understandable are going to be in heaven. I'm talking about right here. What God has promised to his sons and his daughters. How many of you still have children at home? Let me see your hand. All right. How many of them have to worry about what they're going to eat? Well, some of you maybe don't cook, so they might have to worry about what they're going to eat. But. How many of them have to worry about whether or not there's a roof over their head. That's ridiculous, right? Because you've got that. You've got that. We as parents, we got that. There, you know, we, we take care of that. That's, that's what we do. So if, you're, if your kids are worrying about that, they're doing so unnecessarily. They really should just go to sleep because they can't do nothing about the mortgage. They, can't, they don't have the capacity to handle that with the birthday money they got from grandma. They just can't do that. They don't have the capacity to handle those kinds of things. And I think God looks at you and just like you look at your child and says, why are you worried? You can't do anything about it anyway, but I can and I will just trust me and quit worrying. 
But there's a gap. There's a gap. We can read, you are a royal priesthood. We can read it and accept the priesthood part, but reject the royal part. We don't get that part. We don't understand that part. Therefore, we don't accept that part. We don't even know what that means. What does that mean to be royal? And because we don't have a revelation about what it means to be the royalty of God, we don't raise royalty. And our sons and daughters don't know who they are in Christ. And we raise sons that treat women like slaves instead of like royalty. And we raise daughters who will give someone their virtue in exchange for attention and acceptance. There's a gap. See, the revelation of this concept, the power of the authentic you, will begin to take root and have effect after and only after. There's a shift in how I think about myself. And a move from what I've identified myself to be to what God has identified me to be. And when that happens, and when the gap begins to close, the more it closes, the more understanding I will have concerning the real me. And the more Christ-like I will be. And the more anointed I will be. And the more effective I will be for the kingdom of God and for his namesake. But it's time to close the gap. It's time to gain new understanding about what the scripture says that God has said of us as his sons and daughters. And we're going to continue this next week. We didn't even get to our text yet, but I want you to study that chapter this week. Maybe in your reading this week, study that chapter, Jeremiah chapter 1. The magnitude of this statement that God makes to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I can't wait for us to talk about it. We're going we're gonna to really see. It's not just what God thinks of you now. It's the fact that he thought of you and planned your life, chose you, gave you significance, gave you purpose. Out of all that could have been created, he picked you. And he said, I need him. And I need her. Before the foundation of the earth, before he spoke the worlds into existence, he called you and is preparing you and wants to use you to make a significant impact in the day in which you're living, in today, right now, today. When you look at it that way, it makes you really ask the question, am I really doing what God wanted me to do. I mean, all of this, you know, you're talking about earth years. We're six, six, seven thousand years in the making here. Are, are you really doing what God called you and birthed you and assigned you to do? You will come to know it as you discover the real you. I can't wait for next week. It's going to be great. As the worship team comes, I want to end today by asking you this question. Because again, as I've already said, one of the most powerful limitations that can hinder what God has called you to do are the ones that we put on ourselves. So I want you to ask yourself, just take a moment right here. I want you to ask yourself, what confining label, shortcoming, failure, mistake, habit, 
anything like that. What have you put on yourself? What have you attached to your identity that is contrary to who God says that you are? Do you ever talk to yourself and just say, I'm just a loser? I'm just a failure. I'm just, I'm just messed up. I'm just a hot mess. Or I'm just an addict. Or I'm just a worrier. I just have anxiety. I just have it. It's just, it's just who I am. Maybe you've told yourself, I just can't stop sinning in this area. I just can't do it. Or maybe you've told yourself, you know what, I just, I just don't have enough talent to do anything significant for God. It's time for the gap to close. It's time for there to be a shift in your thinking and a move from the hindering labels and reputation that you've assigned to yourself. I move from that to now the one that God says you are. Because you're not a loser. God says you're a winner. You're not a failure. In God, you're victorious. You're not a mess up. You're maturing and you're growing. And you're learning from your mistakes. And you're no longer a worrier. You're learning what God does for those that are His. I want to pray over you today. I want to ask you to stand, would you? Please. Father, as I pray here this morning for my brothers and sisters, I pray, first of all, for the one who does not belong to you yet. I pray, Lord, that for the person who has yet to surrender their life to Christ, I pray for them right now, God, that if they're here this morning, they're not yet able to, to claim and lay hold of this new identity found in Christ because you are yet to redeem them. If that's you this morning, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, all you have to do is simply say, Jesus, I come to you. I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I understand you died on the cross for me. I believe that. I confess that. I confess that you are my Lord, that you are my Savior. I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to come into my life to become my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I will serve you with all that I am and all that I have with your strength. I will become a new, pers a new person, a new creation in Christ. That's all you have to say. You pray that simple prayer, ABC. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Confess him as Lord and Savior. And the Bible says that you are saved. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And today your new identity begins. Your new identity begins in him. For the rest of you that are in the room and you're struggling... You find yourself in the gap. You find yourself caught somewhere in between what you've labeled yourself to be and what God declares that you are in Christ. Father, I just speak over every person here in this room. I speak over every person who is, who is worshiping with us this morning online. I speak over every person, and I just declare that right now every label... First of all, I want to speak over other people's opinions and other people's labels. Right now, they're broken off of your people in Jesus' name. Lord, we will not be confined. We will not walk according to other people's opinions. No, we will walk according to what you say we are. So right now, we break off everybody else's opinion. We break off the opinions of the world. We break off the opinions of those that are not for us, those that are against us. Lord, we break those opinions. They have no power over us. 
And Lord, I come against also the opinions that we have of ourselves. God, some people here in this room, some people under the sound of my voice, don't love who they are. They don't even like who they are. They wish they could be somebody else. But Lord, right now, I'm praying right now, even now, right now, Spirit of God, move on them. Right now, there is an acceptance of who I am. And at the same time, there is an acceptance of the fact that you are working in me, that you desire to work in me, that you desire to take me, create me, shape me, mold me, grow me, mature me into someone that I would love to be. Let that happen right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you're someone who... If you're someone who lives with restrictions that you put on yourself, if you live with a reputation that you placed on yourself and you don't think you can leave it, come on, I just sense the, the, the chains, that, that bondage and the, that bondage of limitation, it's, it's going to be broken off of you right now, but you got to let it go. you got to let it go. So if that's you, I just want to ask you to raise your hand towards heaven right now. Come on, raise your hands towards heaven and say, God, show me who, my, show me who I am. Lord, reveal to me. Begin to reveal to me who I am right now. God, I don't want to walk in the limitations that I placed on myself. Lord, I'm listening. I'm listening to you right now. What do you want me to be, God? I'm listening, God. I'm listening. Teach me, God. I'm not going to be confined. I'm not going to walk in limitation. No, I'm going to be the man. I'm going to be the woman that you called me to be. I receive it right now in Jesus' name. Come on, I receive it. The, the restrictions, the bondage, the limitation you put on, your, on yourself are broken right now in Jesus' name. And the gap is beginning to close. And right now, there's a shift. There's a shift taking place. And as you dive into his presence, and as you begin to read his word, he is going to reveal himself to you. And as he reveals himself to you, he reveals yourself to you. Uh, oh, Jesus, reintroduce us to ourselves. The us that you say that we are. The us that you say we are. I want to walk in what you say that I am. God, change my mind. Change my perspective. Give me a new identity. Not from your perspective, but from mine. I'm a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Anybody thankful for who you are in Christ? Anybody glad you're in Christ this morning? Oh, come on, come on. Anybody glad that he's changing the way you see yourself, God? Thank you for changing the way that I see myself. Oh, come on. Can we sing this song and declare who God says we are? Come on, sing it, Jen. Say it. And remember, hold to the truth, speak without fear, and walk in God's boldness this week.